Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS. I head the Global Health Policy Center. We're delighted to hold this forum today. We're particularly delighted to be able to pull in at the outset of this forum uh, Yaqub El Hilo, the UN resident and humanitarian coordinator in Damascus. I'll say a few words about Yaqub uh, in my introduction of him in a moment. Um, uh, I want to, uh, first of all, give a special thanks to the speakers and the moderators on the panel that will be here over the course of the morning. I also want to offer a special thanks to my colleagues. Um, Ian Gottesman, uh, in particular, has worked really um, indefatigably to pull together with his partners in Damascus this forum today. It may be subject to some technical uh, difficulties. We, we don't do that. We, this is new, new terrain for us. But uh, I, I'm, I'm confident we're going to have a good discussion and be able to hear live from Jacob in, in Damascus. Um, I want to also offer special thanks to Lindsay Hammergren, uh, who from our side has, has pulled all of this together. This is the, the last week of, of substantive work by Lindsay before she moves towards graduate school at GW and a master's of public health starting this fall. Many other people have, have contributed to this. Um, Bree Backus. Uh, Ryan Sickles, Katie Peck, Sahil Angelo, Beverly Kirk, who's worked on a video, we'll be releasing a video shortly um, that tracks with this subject. A few quick remarks. We're now more than three years into a profoundly cruel internal war uh, in Syria, and that has generated a human crisis unlike anything really that we've seen in a very long time in scale, a colossal scale, the reach of this inside Syria and into the surrounding region, and the continued growth and expansion of that human crisis. We're here to talk about that. We're here to talk about it from multiple angles. Uh, an estimated 160,000 people have been killed since the conflict began in March 2011. That is a pretty astronomical mortality rate for an internal war. And right now, it's hard to see that there's a political settlement or military victory in sight, but that does not argue against a continuing to struggle at multiple levels with what can be done to begin to arrest and reverse this. We hear a lot about the Assad regime's sustained violence against civilians, uh, that the way in which regime violence has been used as a tool of war against civilian populations. We hear a lot about attacks by armed militant groups. And, and the fact that over 9 million people, uh, 9 million Syrians have been driven from their homes, that's nearly half the half the population. Three million of that population have crossed into uh, Lebanon, 100,000 new refugees per month continuing to spill into the region. They crossed into Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, Egypt, severely overburdening the host countries and threatening region-wide instability. Uh, Syrians that are displaced within their country struggle to find security, medical care, and housing, as we'll hear today. Uh, there, has been, uh, there have been profound obstacles in getting access, humanitarian access, to that population. Of an estimated 3 million folks that people like Yaqub struggle to, uh, to, to, to reach. Um, the Assad regime and increasingly also armed factions routinely block safe delivery of humanitarian relief in defiance of international norms and Security Council. <laughs> U Security Council passed UN uh, resolution, Security Council Resolution 239 in February 22nd, and it's now four months, almost full four months since that point of passage. And we've, uh, we'll be talking today about wh whether that has opened windows of any kind at an operational level in terms of negotiated local truces, the sort of work that occupies the, the, the UN operation in Damascus on a daily basis. In the meantime, at the, big, at the macro level, uh, people continue to pay attention to the to, to direct our attention to the fact that Syria is becoming more chaotic and an expanding haven for violent Islamic extremists. And th that growth of power by radical Islamic extremists is now extending quite aggressively into neighboring state of Iraq. We'll spend a lot of time today talking about the wanton and deliberate targeting by the Assad regime of health workers and infrastructure, talk a lot about the medical professionals who have been jailed or, jailed or detained, or died and the collapse of, of care and what that has meant in terms of downstream public health consequences, both treatment of cancer, diabetes, hypertension, risk of childbirth, a generation of children who find themselves without schooling, vulnerable, traumatized, ill, 
and, the, and in terms of downstream impacts, the fact that uh, Syria has become an exporter of polio uh, in this recent uh, period, and that in early May, Sec uh, WHO Secretary General Margaret Chan designated it, uh, designated a global health emergency, um, uh, and uh, designated particularly Syria, Pakistan, Nigeria, uh, and Cameroon as particularly important uh, players. The U.S. has joined with other uh, partners internationally in, in being very supportive and very generous in the humanitarian response. Over $2 billion committed in a fairly short period of time. That is a, 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 a staggering commitment. Um, it's one that we should be very proud of. It's one that raises questions of sustainability. Countless Syrian and international personnel on a daily basis risk their lives to deliver assistance inside Syria and in the surrounding region to navigate a security environment that is ever changing. This has provoked, this crisis, this human crisis has provoked a debate. It's provoked a crisis of conscience over the international community's difficulty and failure so far to stem the massive suffering and transcend the multiple obstacles that the Assad regime and others impose. We do know that these costs and the re repair of them are going to take uh, are profound, long-lasting. Long -lasting. They're worsening, and they will, they, they, they will take years to overcome, and there are no easy answers to this. We know that there's active debate around whether to, how to pursue, with, pursue local truces and negotiated access, uh, whether there should be um, a defiance of, of national boundaries to expedite national uh, re uh, relief cross-border, whether there should be a return to the Security Council for, uh, uh, for uh, continued um, and, and greater and more aggressive action. Um, increasingly, there are calls, and we'll hear more about this later in the day, for arming moderate opposition. Um, and uh, at, we will hear more about the fact that in, in, the, in the ultimate resolution of this war, there will be a need for uh, some form of an effective coalition of the willing and a shift out of the current deadlock and a return to diplomacy and negotiated settlement. Um, we'll look at these issues, as I said, from several angles. And we're going to begin this morning with Jacob El Hilo, the UN resident and, and humanitarian coordinator in Damascus on live video. We've asked him to do a few things, uh, to provide an overview of humanitarian relief and the operational environment that he's worked on. He's been there since August of 2013. He comes from a remarkable 23-year career in UNHCR and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, working in the toughest places. Uh, he was the director more recently, before coming in August in 2013. For three years, he was the director of the Middle East and North Africa Division, the second office at UNHCR in Geneva, a very tough post. Before that, was served for several years in Iraq, 03 to 06, a critical period. Uh, served in Tanzania in the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, based in Saudi. Um, he is a bachelor, of, has a bachelor's of law uh, from the University of Khartoum. He's a friend and someone we've known for a very long time. And he's agreed to talk about the overview. He's uh, talk about what it's meant after UN Security Council Resolution 2139, the efforts at truces and negotiated access, how the shifting security environment He'll talk about those operational challenges. He'll talk about the difficulty of navigating, con delivering s support to four million people who are within reach from the government side, serving that population while trying as well to serve populations that are in opposition-controlled territory in a period in which NGO capacity and retaliation is, is a high risk. He'll talk about the sustainability, the, the sense of how do you carry forward and sustain international interest in this, in this period. We'll be followed immediately afterwards, Nancy Lindborg and Rabe Torme from, the international, from USAID and the International Medical Corps will continue the conversation around humanitarian operations. That'll be followed by a panel looking at the destruction of the, of the health sector and the public health consequences. Len Rubenstein will moderate that with Andre Gittleman from Physicians for Human Rights, Ron Waldman from GW, and Marianne Brennan from CDC. And then we'll close over lunch with a broader discussion around the policy options. Mike Gerson from Washington Post, one campaign. Kathleen Hicks, head of our international security program and a former senior policy, policy official in the Obama administration of the Department of Defense. And Zahir Salul, founder and leader of the Syrian American Medical Society. So with that, I'd like to 
first of all, uh, thank you all for coming, and I'd like to turn to turn the floor to Jakub and ask him if he could open up uh, the discussion with, um, uh, with uh, 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, take more time if you care to, and we will, uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, when we get to the point in the program where you've had a chance to cover this terrain, we'll open to the audience for some questions and comments to come back to you. Jakub, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we really appreciate this. We know you have a, a rigorous schedule, so thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Steve, and uh, uh, a very good morning to you all in Washington. Um, from here, uh, all of us here in, in Damascus and in Syria. Steve, thank you very much for uh, giving us also this opportunity to uh, uh, be with you this morning and to try, um, even if in a modest way, uh, bring um, to the discussion some of the uh, key issues that we, or key uh, dynamics that we uh, continue to battle with um, on the ground. Uh, trying uh, and trying and trying to reach as uh, many civilians as possible uh, in Syria with uh, humanitarian aid, but also trying to navigate um, what is a complex uh, web of, uh, of developments and daily occurrences uh, as this conflict, as this uh, vicious uh, conflict continues to, uh, to rage. Steve, you spoke about the bigger picture and how Syria today represents probably the most difficult challenge that the world is facing. It certainly is one that is unprecedented in recent times in this part of the world, uh, given its scale, the speed with which uh, the, uh, the catastrophe is unfolding, but also the uh, profound impact it has had so far and will continue to have uh, on the lives of people uh, in Syria, uh, certainly, but also uh, in the region. Um, I will try to uh, quickly try to describe the context in which we operate, but also the situation as it stands now in Syria. Uh, until three years ago, this country was a middle-income country. Until three years ago, this was the third largest refugee hosting country in the world, uh, coming only after uh, Pakistan, uh, and Iran, uh, both of which, as you know, host large numbers of Afghan refugees. Syria was the third, because in addition to the 540,000 Palestine refugee population that lived here for decades, um, Syria also hosted large numbers of Iraqi refugees, but also many others from many other countries in the region and beyond. So this was only three years ago. Today, half of the Syrian people um, are displaced, as you rightly said. Today, and this is according to a recent study uh, put out by the Center for Strategic Research in Damascus, supported by UNDP and UNRWA, um, three quarters of the Syrian population live in poverty. And in fact, 20% of that live in acute poverty. Unemployment is over 50%. Uh, 2.5 million jobs have been lost over the last uh, three years. And uh, the story with the Syrian refugees is well known, and now their number is reaching 3 million, a projection that sadly is coming to pass, as was put out by UNHCR uh, late last year. So uh, this, is, this is Syria today. This is Syria, which until three years ago was one of, one, one of the safest countries on earth. And today, even movements within Damascus uh, and any other urban setting uh, needs to be for most people uh, with great difficulty and certainly for UN humanitarian and other personnel in armored vehicles. Um, and that is also true to many of our partners operating in Syria today. So this is the environment and this is the result of three years of vicious conflict that uh, a solution to it uh, remains very, very elusive. Um, late last year, we projected that uh, the number of people requiring humanitarian assistance in Syria this year, in 2014, would be 9.3 uh, million people. Here we are now actually at the moment of reviewing. Uh, this is the mid-year point. We are reviewing our uh, uh, chart, that is the humanitarian assistance uh, 
uh, strategy. Um, and it is already clear that the number of people needing and requiring humanitarian assistance uh, has gone up and will go up uh, by the time we reach uh, the end of this year. Um, this is also the moment when we are looking at uh, what is it that we have been able uh, to achieve despite all the difficulties and the constraints. And I will talk to you about whether 2139 has helped or not. And I will talk about what other uh, channels and possibilities we continue to pursue in order to reach uh, as many civilians as possible uh, and deliver aid to them. Um, the uh, security situation because of this conflict, I can best describe it. It's a very clumsy uh, conflict also. Um, there are many sides to it. It is very difficult to map out uh, who is who. Um, and that is obviously easier when you uh, are referring to the government side. But even there, there are many operatives within the government side uh, involved in this conflict. But the task becomes even more difficult, if not impossible, if you want to map out the operatives on the opposition side, uh, because their number is large and their uh, ideas are different and their uh, places of presence are also multiple. And uh, they are spread in many different parts of the country. Um, so it is in an environment like this that the humanitarian uh, workers in Syria strive to reach and deliver. It is in an environment like this where, um, ironically, even if it's a country at war and it is a country where uh, the government has lost uh, quite significantly in many of its parts, um, it is also a country where the government continues to operate as if you know, uh, not much has happened over the last uh, three years, where systems and procedures and bureaucracy and hurdles are a fact of life, uh, even if they have delayed significantly our ability to reach and deliver, um, they have also not, uh, and, and thankfully, not completely barred us from, from doing so, um, where the need for simplification is obviously quite uh, evident. So. It's almost a schizophrenic situation where uh, it's a, a country at, at war, and we have seen many in that situation where the central government does lose a lot of its grip and power. Um, but as far as Syria is concerned, I'm afraid that is not necessarily the case, and that is uh, partly uh, uh, some of the, the challenge that we, we face uh, in dealing with a, an ever-growing humanitarian uh, situation uh, but an ever-growing complex web of, of procedures and systems. Uh, by the same token, um, trying to reach people and deliberate um, is equally challenged by the, uh, the multiplicity of actors, as I said, on the part of the opposition, but also in some instances, the lack of understanding even of what is it that we are trying to do when we try to reach places to uh, administer call you vaccines or try to reach places to fix water pipes, uh, as we see today in Aleppo, where uh, sadly again, water is becoming a weapon of war uh, with a direct impact uh, on the lives of no less than 3 million uh, people. So uh, it is an, a security environment which is highly unstructured. It is a conflict that is highly clumsy, uh, adding to the challenge. Um, this has impacted directly people in every sense. This is a conflict that is now in its fourth year, and Syrians are resilient people. They are extremely resilient people. Um, they are patient, and they can withstand pressure. But this is having a toll on them. This is eroding on their ability to cope. This is really uh, the reason why uh, three-quarters of the population is now living uh, in poverty, and this is uh, the reason why many are driven away from their homes because of insecurity, but also others who are moving, seeking services elsewhere in the country or out of the country altogether, as we have seen with uh, the many refugees who have chosen to uh, cross borders. Um, the UN and our partners continue to be present, uh, not only in Damascus, we are in Homs, we are now also in Aleppo, we are in the northeast in Kamishli. This is the far northeastern corner 
of the country, very much near to the theater of happenings as we see now on the Iraqi side uh, in Ninawa governorate, uh, just across the border, where over the last 24, 36 hours, we have also been observing the dynamics uh, there with the ISIS um, uh, taking uh, control of a number of locations, but also perhaps most notably the city of Mosul. Um, this will definitely have an impact on the situation in Syria, uh, in security terms, no doubt, and that is very much uh, clear, uh, will be the case in Deir Zor governorate, where ISIS already has a significant presence, um, in Raqqa governorate, which is totally under the control of ISIS, and in Hasaka governorate, um, where despite the presence of government forces, but also Kurdish militias, uh, I am uh, confident and sure and concerned that the developments across the border on the Iraqi side will certainly have an impact um, uh, on the Syrian side in humanitarian terms. We already understand that some Iraqis have crossed the border and sought safety on the Syrian side in Hasaka governorate. This is just an example of how ever-changing the situation on the ground is and how uh, dynamic it remains to be, but also how complex it, it, it continues to grow uh, with multiple humanitarian challenges. We've just come out of uh, the polio scare, and in many ways, it can be described as a successful story of being able to reach uh, three million under fives and administer the vaccination. But now we have a measles uh, scare, and with the water shortages and the summer setting in, we are also gearing up for other uh, complications, cholera included, um, which are yearly occurrences in terms of water shortages, uh, triggering uh, uh, related diseases and pandemic uh, outbreak. But uh, this year, we have the additional uh, uh, compounded problem of uh, using water as a weapon of war, as I mentioned earlier. And this is the case in Aleppo, where water has been obstructed and the network has been sabotaged and damaged, uh, in this case by opposition groups, uh, feeding uh, the city of Aleppo. So the UN and our partners continue to work in this environment uh, at great risk. Uh, we have come here all accepting that this is a mission that is not without risks. And the risks are real and the risks are high. So far, the humanitarian community since the beginning of this conflict has lost 51 of our own. The great majority of that uh, number of heroes who have fallen in the line of duty come from the Syrian Arab Red Crescent uh, our uh, major partner uh, in Syria. Um, the volunteers have paid the ultimate price uh, in their quest to deliver on their mission, but also UN personnel have lost their lives. Um, and one, at least in the case of one NGO in 2012, also a humanitarian worker paying, paying the ultimate price. So this is a mission that is um, not without risks, and all have accepted that. Um, but it, my concern is that the risks continue to grow, as does the enormity of the humanitarian challenge itself. Now, um, of course, there are, and it depends who you're talking to, there are glimpses of, of hope as to whether uh, attempts at local reconciliation will help us uh, do better. Um, every time we cross a line, uh, I consider it to be a truce, even if it's for a day or two or three days. Every time we cross a line from a government-controlled uh, area into an opposition-controlled area, it has to be backed by a ceasefire. Um, and more often than not, this works, uh, but at times it gets seriously ruptured, if not totally and brutally uh, violated. As you may, may recall, in, uh, in February this year, when we uh, went into the old city of Homs for the first time, in a year um, where UN and SARC humanitarian staff uh, with a lot of civilians on the ground came under shelling while the humanitarian mission was inside the old city. This is just an example of um, even with the best of intentions and all the guarantees and assurances from all sides, um, these things happen. And that is where wrong place, wrong time in Syria today kills. There is no other uh, way to describe it.
and this is again the environment in which the humanitarian workers continue um, to operate. But local truces, um, in my view, and I think um, they need to be studied much more uh, in depth, um, because if they have an impact, I would say that impact is on the um, reintroduction of a normality of life for the civilian people, irrespective of their political uh, considerations, irrespective of whether these are considered to be surrenders or withdrawals or giving up or giving in, irrespective of that, when they happen, they also uh, lead to creating an environment in which civilians either can live without the fear of having a mortar landing on their roof uh, and that possibility persists, or those who have left um, who also have the ability to come back uh, and stay in their area of origin. Um, they are not consistent. They are actually quite clumsy, these uh, attempts at local reconciliation, many of which have certain common features, but uh, a lot of them have their own specificities. Um, and in fact, the UN has not been involved um, in any of them, and there are many, except perhaps in the case of, of Homs, where uh, in different ways the UN was involved, first uh, through a total and a full humanitarian operation in February, uh, leading to the evacuation of civilians and delivery of aid into the old city, and second uh, in, in May, where the evacuation of the last remaining fighters um, and the surrender of, or the release of 70 prisoners also took place. The, the, the second experiment in, involved the UN, but not the humanitarian UN. It involved the resident coordinator, uh, the office of the Joint Special Representative in Syria, uh, supported by the UN Department for Safety and Security. And that was deliberate. It was done to firewall, if you wish, humanitarian workers from being involved in what was essentially uh, a military operation, uh, or at least a military negotiation uh, leading to the return of the old city of Homs to the government, but also the safe passage of no less than 2,296 uh, fighters out of that location into another area controlled uh, by the opposition. Uh, many of these efforts, Steve, take place in uh, cross-line settings. Uh, planning and preparing for these interagency missions is a nightmare because it entails talking to everybody, as I mentioned earlier, but even with that, uh, glitches do occur. Um, we, uh, of course, um, look still uh, quite uh, anticipatingly um, to see if in the coming period, uh, in the coming immediate period, uh, there will be a breakthrough concerning um, another provision of Security Council Resolution 2139, and that is using cross-border uh, deliveries to reach more communities, especially those uh, living in areas adjacent to international borders specifically in the north, and that is the Turkish-Syrian border, and in the east, that is the Iraqi border, as well as in the south, and that is the Jordanian-Syrian border. Um, with the developments in Iraq um, over the last few hours, the crossing point at al Yarubia is now controlled, reportedly by ISIS, so that's an immediate uh, showstopper, even if there was a possibility to use that crossing to bring aid from Kurdistan into northeast Syria. Uh, this new development obviously uh, means uh, bad news for us. Uh, so we still remain hopeful that uh, the northern border and the southern borders will um, uh, be allowed for us and our partners to, uh, to be used, including uh, to areas or points not controlled by the government. Um, 2139 has helped uh, create an opportunity, but I will not go as far as say as saying that it has changed the dynamics fully. Uh, 2139 has uh, maybe allowed us to bring aid from Turkey into northeast uh, Syria to Kamishli uh, Nusaybin crossing point, which I think was a, a good example of using humanitarian dialogue to unblock some of the political uh, blockages that. Uh, seem to be there between the two countries. Um, but that was obviously not enough and not sufficient. Um, but it was a good start. Um, what we are looking for now is more of that 
including areas or points controlled by the opposition. But even when that happens, and I hope it does happen soon, because it will augment and complement our efforts to try and reach and deliver in a much more uh, systematic and uh, predictable way, um, even credible way, I would say, it will add to our credibility if we are able to use all means possible to reach civilians in a timely uh, 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 fashion. Um, even when that breakthrough is in hand, and I do hope it will be, um, let's not forget the environment in which we will be doing this. Let's not forget that in northern Syria, there is um, a conservative estimate would put no less than three to four hundred, four uh, hundred uh, armed groups um, in the area operating. And it is said that 87 nationalities um, are fighting in Syria today. Uh, they come with different ideas of what needs to be done in Syria and with Syria. And they are there and they are encountered as we encountered them exactly four weeks ago when we tried to reach uh, villages north of, Ale north of Aleppo um, delivering aid. So we came across Chechen fighters and we came across local commanders and we came across other uh, obstacles uh, that really uh, saw humanitarian aid as, as uh, either unnecessary or if it is necessary, it has to be used according to local terms as seen and harbored by the local uh, commanders. So negotiating access has taken another dimension in Syria. Uh, and we have taken it to a different level, I should say. And here I will say it very openly that to do so, you have to talk to everybody. And I think everybody in the room understands what I'm talking about. If we really want to do that, and what is it that I'm talking about? Delivering aid and reaching communities and people in need, but also doing so in a way that preserves the safety and the security and the physical integrity of your own staff. Uh, to do so, we have to talk to everybody. Um, the um, final point, um, and I'm sorry I already spoke uh, maybe too long, um, this is the situation now. It is a complex situation. It is a dramatically dire situation because the impact of it on the individual civilian in Syria is truly quite profound. And the, the, the damage that has been done to the social fabric in this country but also the physical destruction that has inflicted uh, the infrastructure, uh, entire cities uh, and neighborhoods, but also um, uh, service uh, delivery points. And this is very true to hospitals. You know the statistics. This is very true to schools. You also know the statistics. And uh, it is now said that one out of every four schools in Syria um, is out, is out of service either because of uh, damage, serious damage or total destruction, or it is being used as a, uh, a military facility or being used to shelter internally displaced uh, persons. The same is true to the health facilities. Um, but despite all these challenges, I think it is good not to forget that efforts to continue to try and deliver, and if WFP, the World Food Programme, is today able to reach 4 million people, this is a massive operation by the way, to try and reach 4 million people in an environment like this. It is really impressive, the amount of logistical planning, but also the, the volume of movement of convoys and trucks. Uh, on average, WFP is moving 4,000 trucks every month to reach that many people with food aid. This is just an example. The same applies to health uh, deliveries, although there we have significant constraints uh, placed by the government, uh, especially when such deliveries of health supplies are to go into uh, hot spots, contested areas, or areas controlled by the opposition, we really have uh, significant challenges there, if not total obstruction, uh, especially when it comes to trauma kits and surgical uh, equipment. Uh, but these are some of the day-to-day -day battles we continue to fight here, uh, and I hope this can be overcome in the coming period either through a realization uh, by the government here that to deliver such supplies and medicine, even if it is to people in opposition-controlled areas, is not to, to mean uh, curing fighters. It is to mean treating civilians who otherwise face the true risks of death if they continue unattended to. Um, 
that is um, um, all to say um, it is uh, an environment in which uh, the perpetual nature of this uh, crisis and the elusive uh, political solution to it uh, that remains to be the case, uh, I fear things are going to get worse. I fear that no matter how we perfect our uh, humanitarian deliveries, we will be chasing behind the problem. And I fear even when we do that well and reach as many people as we want to reach with aid, we will be doing important work, urgent work that will save lives, but it will not solve the problem. The problem in this country has been, is, and will continue to be a political problem that can only be resolved in my view, and this is not just my view, I think this is the view of the United Nations, including at the level of the Secretary General, uh, it can only be a solution that is reached through political uh, dialogue. So final word, Steve, uh, this is a conflict that has gone and lasted for far too long. It should not have happened in the first place. Uh, the world should not have allowed it to uh, bring the Syrians to their knees. The civilians have suffered and they continue and they will sadly continue to suffer. But that has happened, uh, and the whole world was watching. But um, it is one where um, I hope, uh, I hope that the, uh, the the force of logic will be the one that the world will adopt to try and find a way out of this uh, disaster, rather than the logic of force. Steve, thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, thank you, Jacob. Um, thank you. Todd, um, the, um, I think uh, you, the, you, what you have uh, presented to us uh, this morning, um, uh, extremely uh, rich uh, and forceful in the, in the candor and the realism that you bring to this task and the, the sweep, the comprehensive sweep at trying to capture in 20 or 30 minutes, this is what you confront. Uh, I, it's, it's quite remarkable and it's quite powerful. Um, you put quite a focus in your remarks upon the shift that's underway towards more consideration around cross-border and cross-line. I mean, the pressure's building. The pressure's building to find a way forward in a terrible, in a terrible and risky situation. Um, maybe you could say a bit more about what will it take? What will it take in terms of consent on the government side towards moving ahead in that way? That's one question. A second question is, how do you get assurances that in your negotiations with the multiple armed entities that you require their protection or their consent? And when you think, and third is about capacity. We know that. NGOs that operate, UN agencies that operate, are, they do not have an infinite capacity. They do not have an in infinite capacity to take risk. So how do you begin to, um, if you have expanded access by cross line or cross border, and you are working assiduously to get consent from the government and a, and a confidence level with armed groups that you can enter that environment how do you then persuade your partners that this is a worthwhile risk to accept? Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Um, uh, all along, the discussion on cross-border uh, has been quite uh, an intense one um, here in Damascus, but also uh, elsewhere. Uh, but here in Damascus, the government's position um, so far has been, we have no problem with any crossing point along any border with any neighboring country that you can use to bring in aid and reach communities uh, needing that aid in Syria. The only condition is that such crossing point needs to be, quote unquote, a legal crossing point, legal crossing point. And that means, when we ask, what does that mean? A legal crossing point is one that is under the control of the government right. and is one the use of which will not compromise the sovereignty of Syria. And when they say that, by the way, Steve, I think, um, first of all, I don't think there's any country in the region, or maybe even in the world, that knows the UN and its 
dealings in New York better than Syria. They've been doing this for six decades. Um, so they know what UN resolution, UN Security Council resolutions are and what they mean, and they use them. And in this case, they were using Security Council Resolution 2139, which speaks about uh, preserving the sovereignty of Syria, which speaks about adhering to the principles uh, enshrined in the guiding principles. And uh, even if there is no direct reference to the General Assembly resolution that talks about this, but a reference is made in the, in the Security Council resolution that uh, any such efforts or operations will have to be in consultation with and uh, uh, with the consent, consent of the, uh, uh, the, the country or the government concerned. So they use that effectively. Um, this has been the case ever since, before 2139 came to being, but also after, and especially after. Um, I know that for the moment there are frantic efforts uh, in New York, uh, perhaps facilitated by Russia, to try and reach at a, a consensus producing a new resolution, uh, this time on cross-border operations. The viewpoints are still um, different. Um, but what is interesting is that, and this is something we have verified here in Damascus over the last couple of days with very senior government officials as to whether it is true that Syria is ready uh, to consider cross-border uh, efforts and deliveries. And the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is yes. But of course, there will always be uh, caveats and, uh, and expectations. But the fact that we have moved this half an inch step uh, towards hopefully realizing a breakthrough on allowing deliveries cross borders, including through crossing points that are not under the control of the government. Um, this will be uh, a, a very important uh, breakthrough. Uh, and I will not uh, emphasize enough how important that will be. But I will also not be too romanticizing of it because the majority of the people are not living next to the borders. The majority of the people are in fact, very far from the borders. Uh, and some of them continue to be in enclaves of besiegement, mainly by the government, but also by the opposition, um, that are far from the border. So even if we are able to reach more people uh, through cross-border deliveries in the coming period, if there is a resolution, uh, which will be very good and very important, uh, and then we will talk about how to actually do it in such an unstructured and highly a volatile and ever-shifting security environment. That's a, that's a real question that we also have to confront, even if we have a resolution. Um, but let's also not forget that the majority of the people are not waiting for cross-border deliveries. The majority of the people are in other parts of the country, sitting nowhere near any international uh, border. Um, everyone in this conflict um, has played a, a very <laughs> significant role in creating the problem. That is definitely true to the government, but that is also true to the opposition groups. And we talked about that there. But again, um, it takes risk uh, to, um, to actually go there and, and meet and sit and um, solicit the support. Uh, and before that happens, it takes um, a considerable amount of, of contact through Skype and through uh, even uh, cell phones, uh, but mainly through Skype. Um, to try and, um, and uh, put the fundamentals of what is it that we are trying to do, why are we coming to see you, what is it that we are bringing, for how many people, uh, uh, the routes that we intend to take. Um, and it's never as simple or perfect as I make it sound. It is really a daunting task um, because of the multiplicity of actors. And some of them are really not small actors. Uh, among the opposition groups, um, and therefore uh, getting the uh, support of them all is 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 not questionable, is unquestionable, because without it, uh, you end up running into problems, and we do run into problems. Um, so, uh, Touchwood, so far we have been lucky, but incidents have occurred, as I said, in the old city of Homs, uh, but also elsewhere, and we have. Uh, manage to just use that one simple thing, that this is a UN and humanitarian partner mission that is not coming escorted, that is not coming with weapons, 
that is not coming with a political agenda or a, a military agenda. We know you have an estimated number of uh, under fives, and we know that the civilian population in your area is X, Y, or Z, and this is what we would like to actually do, deliver that aid, counting on your uh, facilitation, but also counting on your protection um, of the supplies, but also the staff who are accompanying uh, them. Um, so that will always continue to be a requirement, and I'm sure in the room there are many with uh, influence and leverage or contacts to continue impressing and reinforcing this message that in Syria, the United Nations humanitarian agencies and our partners are ready to talk to everyone, coordinate with everyone, cross line, but also hopefully cross border in the not too distant future. But that will, in, will take indeed the cooperation of all uh, on all sides to this uh, conflict. Capacity, it is probably one of the, if not the most complex and uh, uh, and in scale, probably one of the largest uh, crises, humanitarian crises, um, we we have in the world today. Uh, its intensity is uh, is there and it speaks uh, for itself. The impact of the civilian population, but also the regional um, implications of this conflict, um, have been talked about uh, many a time, and they are not just ideas or suggestions. In fact the direct affront to regional peace and security is already happening, as we see in countries like Lebanon. And uh, this will be compounded by recent developments in Iraq. Um, but also, um, it is a, an, a situation that continues to grow by the day. Yet, the capacity is so limited. And this is the irony that I referred to earlier, that we are in one of the most complex humanitarian situations on Earth, Yet, whether we like it or not, we continue to deal with many actors uh, in this conflict, but we certainly continue to deal with a government that continues to see things uh, its way uh, and in many times or many instances continues to uh, suggest or assume that um, we are still in 2011 or in 2010, uh, i.e. not much has changed. Um, so that is a daunting task to try and battle such daily battles, but also to fight for more staff, for more offices, for more ability to move around the country um, in order to uh, deliver on our mission. Um, and we have been able to do so, but we need to do a lot more. And for that to happen, we also will continue to require a lot more capacity, both national and uh, international. Over to you, Steve. Thank you. Um we're getting near to the end of the time, and I know it's evening there, and we've taken quite a bit of your time. What I want to do is invite our audience. We could take three or four quick comments or questions. We'll collect those, come back to you. I apologize, Jakub, that you cannot see the audience, but it is full, I promise you. Um, if, there, if there are any comments or questions, uh, there are microphones here. Uh, please put your hand up and uh, identify yourself. If there aren't any, I can come back to Jakob to close uh, with, with, um, uh, on, on one issue that I would like to raise. But are there, any, are there any interventions from the audience? Yes, please. And just be very succinct, identify yourself, and pose your comment or question. There's a microphone behind you. Question for uh, our colleague, uh, heroic colleague in uh, Damascus is, aren't we legitimizing the role and the importance of the different factions by treating them as leaders? Um, after all, most, many of them are thugs that are following um, a false ideology or uh, a uh, personal interest most of the time. Um, so by, um, by giving them importance, by uh, seeking, as you say, their protection, um, aren't we um, perpetuating this uh, wrong situation? That's my question. Thank you. Do we have any other? Do we have any other? Yes, right behind here. I'll come back to you. We'll bundle together 
three or four maximum and come back to you and ask you, Jakob, to close. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm Gary Sargent. I run a small consulting firm. I spent a couple of years in Beirut, so I understand sort of the region. My question really is, is how much is the border between Lebanon and Syria effective? Are you getting aid through there or sort of what those transportation issues are? Thank you. Yes, right here. I'm Chris, a uh, fellow at the United Nations Information Center. So my question would be on the Palestinian refugees. And I wonder how the living situation for Palestinian refugees in Syria right now, and I know some of them fled to Lebanon previously where the living situation for them is dismal. So I wonder um, what is the UN, uh, if the UN has any resolution on that. Thanks. Okay. Any others? Uh, so the issues are around, uh, are you legitimizing, is this legitimizing factions that should not be legitimized? A question around the border with Lebanon, I believe it was, and then a question around Palestinian refugees, status of Palestinian refugees. Right. Back to, you, back to you. Um. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you to the three uh, um, uh, speakers. Uh, we are not legitimizing anyone. Uh, our aim is to reach uh, innocent civilians wherever they are uh, in any part of Syria and deliver to them urgently needed humanitarian assistance, um, especially when that has been seriously disrupted because of the um, uh, destruction that has inflicted uh, basic social infrastructure and delivery of services. So um, um, that is the goal. And for us to realize or attain this goal, as I said earlier, um, we cannot ignore the fact that um, there are uh, operatives on the ground. Uh, some of them uh, may indeed come from a background that uh, the first speaker has, 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 has described. But today they are, um, you know, the law in that spot where they are operating. Um, and by engaging them and by um, talking to them, um, I don't believe we are legitimizing uh, their authority or their presence, but we are pursuing a mission that can only be realized uh, under the current circumstances uh, through such means. Um, and this is unfortunately the case in any of these conflicts that we see around the world where uh, vicious civil wars and, 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 and internal strife uh, has produced so many uh, of these uh, so-called leaders uh, in their uh, localities and uh, with whom we had to deal. Um, um, and that is why it is important, it is important uh, that uh, a solution to this problem is found. It is already too late in many, in many ways. It's certainly too late to the uh, tens of thousands of people who have been killed and those who have been maimed and seriously injured. Um, it is too late. But uh, there are still 20 million Syrians who live in Syria, and they have not given up yet. Uh, so our uh, duty and responsibility also is not to give up and to employ all credible means possible to reach as many civilians as possible and deliver on this uh, mission. Um, the border with Lebanon um, is actually the only lifeline we have uh, out of Damascus, is through a crossing point at a location called al Masna that leads from Damascus to Beirut. So that is, if today we have to reduce staff or evacuate staff, or even when we do our regular travels in and out of, of this part of the country, um, it is only through the Lebanese border. And it is also through that border that the bulk of uh, what we import, especially uh, medical supplies and non-food items, the bulk of that comes through the uh, the Lebanese border uh, at Al-Masla. Uh, of course, we use other entry points, and that is the ports in Latakia and Tartus. We hope to be using the borders north and south, uh, but for the time being, we do use uh, one point along the Turkish-Syrian border, and that is Kamishli, and one along the Jordanian-Syrian uh, border, and that is Nasib. Uh, but we hope to have more of these crossings that will increase our ability to um, to reach people faster and much more predictably. The uh, pre-conflict Palestine refugee population in this country was 540,000. Half of that population is now displaced. They no longer 
live in the places, the homes, or the locations where they lived uh, in March 2011. Half of the Palestinian population is displaced. And in fact, 70,000 of those have become refugees, perhaps for the second, if not the third time, because they left Syria again, and the majority of them are in Lebanon uh, today. Um, you may have noticed, uh, my colleague from uh, the UN Information Center, that when I speak about the people, I speak about civilians, and I don't speak about Syrians, because Syria has a lot of Syrians, no less than 19, 20 million, but there are also others, and I make, make specific reference to the Palestinians. So in order not to exclude anyone needing humanitarian assistance, um, I use civilians. Um, and that is why the Palestine refugee population in Syria continues to receive particular attention because of the double damage, if I can put it this way, that has inflicted them. Uh, Yarmouk camp is a, is a, is a, a global story today, and the besiegement there that has lasted for far too long. Although in recent times, thanks to the efforts of our colleagues at UNRWA, uh, some of that besiegement has been relaxed, but the problem uh, persists. Um, the Armouk problem is just one reminder of how the plight of the Palestinian uh, people uh, in Syria is doubled compared to anybody else. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Jakob. We're getting to the end of our hour here. This audience that's uh, come to hear you this morning is a, it's a diverse audience of Washingtonians, mostly, who are drawn from advocacy groups, from U.S. agencies, from other think tanks, uh, people that are associated with implementing NGOs, uh, those in internet associated with international agencies. So it's a diverse group that have come to, to, to hear from you. Um, we're very grateful to you for taking so much time. I think this is very valuable. The, your voice, the voice from Damascus, from people like you who are working so assiduously to tackle these complex and, and dangerous problems, that voice is often not heard in the kind of vivid way that we've been able to do here today. And I want to thank you for that. I'd like to ask you to close with a thought for us in terms of advice. In America, we have a certain numbness to this crisis. Uh, there are many reasons for this, but people have commented on this. The, perhaps we'll see a change in the opinion climate in America as new data comes forward, but it, that numbness is a problem for us. The US government has, has been extremely generous, putting $2 billion of assets towards this. Congress, on a bipartisan basis, has been very generous and supportive. But we need to move beyond this, and we need to be very uh, assiduous and very careful in preserving the sustainability of these programs. So what is your advice? What is your advice to this audience here about how best to stay the course and sustain hope in this situation? Um, Steve, uh, I would be presumptuous if I have any advice. Um, to give to such a, 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 a gathering of, of experts in, 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 in today's event. But um, perhaps a couple of things. Maybe first, a, a thank you. Um, before asking more, um, a thank you to the American people, because uh, over $2 billion has been given to support humanitarian efforts in the Syria crisis. And that is, um, that is indispensable support that we continue to rely on. Um, this is the fourth year of this conflict. And that fatigue uh, that seems to be creeping in, uh, in addition to the numbness that you referred to, I fear is going to, um, the, even if this is the center of all crises in the world today, I fear it is going to be overshadowed by other happenings around the world. Um, and that fear is perhaps backed by uh, what we see today in terms of the financial support um, to these humanitarian efforts. Um, the American people and the U.S. government have given over $2 billion. People, uh, $2 billion. Uh, the requirements in Syria and in the region for 2014 is um, $6.5 billion. And of that, so far this year, both inside and outside, a $1 billion has been paid. So we still have a long way, and this is almost the middle of the year. So thank you to the American people for having been so generous but we continue to uh, sustain effort to support 
the humanitarian efforts on the ground. Because without that, we will really be taking away from the last hope that millions of Syrians and others living in, in Syria uh, um, will be deprived of that glimpse of hope that they are not alone uh, in this. Um, moving forward, perhaps, um, I think it is not undignified for the world to actually say that a political solution is indeed the only solution and the way out of this. And for that to happen, I think the world needs to take a step back and perhaps even a deep breath. Because if there was a strategy concerning Syria for the last three years, it certainly hasn't worked. It has not worked. But what it has done is uh, uh, led to the suffering of people and it has destroyed many parts of this beautiful country. So if that is the goal, then it is a working strategy. And I don't think anyone in the international community has that interest. So take a step, a step back and a deep breath and maybe give political dialogue a chance, but really one that takes into account the very real dynamics that are taking place on the ground. Over to you. Jakub, thank you so much. Um, this has uh, uh, been an extraordinary conversation this morning for us, and we're very grateful, and we're, and we're very grateful to you for your courage and your commitment uh, in this thank and to you. all of your staff. Uh, and um, I hope we can stay connected. We will, uh, obviously, there will be many other opportunities downstream where we would very much welcome the chance to re-engage with you and hear again from you on how things are going, both by this means or if you happen to be here in Washington by person. So please join me in thanking Jakob Del Hilo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Jakob. Uh, have a good evening. And uh, amazingly, this connection worked. Uh, it did work and beautifully. So thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. I send you all greetings on my behalf and the entire team in Syria in all locations. Thank you for your support and we stay in touch. Thank you.